member of the Historical Society would love to be. It's real easy. If you just fill one of these out and uh, mail it back to us or drop it off to us, and I'd be happy to take your membership and your one. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much for, for coming here today. Uh, and if you don't see one of these, we have some uh, in other locations around the, around the building here. Um, promotion here. Mark your calendars for uh, Boilermaker Sunday, October 10th. Uh, Mr. Dick Williams will be given a program that he has been in training for. Uh, that's a <laughs> Boilermaker Club. <Yeah. laughs> Tough audience. Uh, he's been, uh, a program on Clinton in the 1840s. Okay, I'll stop with the terrible jokes and all that. Uh, speaker today, Dave Garrett. He's back by popular demand. Uh, we had a handful of people last year, and David has gracious and said, I'll do it again. So here he is. Uh, quick introduction, I'm gonna try to do this real quick. Uh, Dave has real close connections to, to Clinton. His mother was Eleanor Buckley Garrett. Uh, she was Clinton native, uh, lived um, in the New Street, uh, B.D. Ave neighborhood in, in the village. Dave grew up on a dairy farm in Poland, New York. He's a graduate of Geneseo State, where I first met him, so that's why I give the plug for Geneseo and, and David and all that. And we have other history, too. Uh, and I must say, he's a cousin, first cousin of my wife, so I have to put that in to keep the home fronts happy, too. Uh, briefly, and I do mean briefly, Dave has had a lengthy career in higher education and is recently retired, well, maybe not so recent, uh, from SUNY Poly, where he was uh, director of international students. He currently owns a unique farm in South Trenton, where he raises exotic waterfowl, pygmy goats, donkeys, horses, and much more. And the presentation doesn't have time to hear the much more. Uh, his neighbors include many families in the Amish community, where he enjoys a very solid reputation and a very solid relationship. So that's what I'm going to say in introduction. And here's Mr. Dave Garrett. Well, welcome everybody, and my name is, again, David Garrett, and uh, I'm not really an expert on Amish. I'm just a person who lives by them, lives with them, and done quite a, bit of, quite a few things with them. I've had Amish neighbors for about 12 years now. When I say neighbors, I mean, I'm on, on Cheese Factory Road. Their farm is on Crooked Brook Road, so we share our back pastures. And what's convenient about that is the kids kind of come cross lots quite a bit. And so it's just really easy to, to get to know them. And we've done a lot of things with that particular family, which has opened the doors to many other families. And it's made it a, a really interesting experience with, the, with the, uh, the Amish in general. I was fairly ignorant of the Amish. I knew they were there. I'd been to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I thought, well, big deal. You know, it's, it's a nice kind of a unique group. But the more I've gotten to know them, the more there is to find out about their life, their culture, their, their community. And they're pretty neat folks in general. Um, I also, through the animals and birds, which we raise on our farm, I've gone to a place called Mount Hope, Ohio, where there's a really large, they used to call them exotic sale. Today they call them alternative animal sale. But uh, it brings people, like 5,000 people together twice a year for a big sale. And it's right in the heart of Amish country in Ohio. And I've been going there for about 30 years now. And that's where I really got my first introduction to the Amish and seeing all the different kind of what we call orders of Amish. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, uh, there's just, they're, they're a very unique group and they're, they're, uh, they're, they're people, they're like you and I, 
a lot of ways, and they're just they're just uh, a nice group to have in our community. Um, Starting just thinking back to uh, old times, uh, I'm going to grab a little piece of paper because there's something I wanted to, I wanted to share. This was uh, something from the past, and I'm not I'm not uh, big in remembering all this stuff. But the uh, if you go back in to the Reformation time, which was 1500s. For those of you that aren't history buffs, and uh, 1517 was when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses on the, on the uh, Wittenberg Castle wall door, and that kind of kicked off the big Reformation, Reformation of the Catholic Church, basically. And and suddenly there were Lutherans, there were Protestants, there were Methodists, there were a, a variety of different subgroups developing. And at that time, the Anabaptists, who were people who believed, the big difference is they believed that people, when they become members of the church, whichever church they belong to, they should do it as an adult, and they should do it as a, a decision, not because they're baptized as a baby and they're just kind of taken into the church. So uh, that, that's the main premise with, uh, with the Mennonites and, and later than the Amish who broke off from them. But uh, I guess early times, uh, well, in those days, there, there was a lot going on. You've got to remember, this is just kind of the end of the feudal system. So all the knights and the castles and all, all the, the wars that went on for so many years. And there was an awful lot of religious persecution. And depending on what religion a person was, you would be in high society or not, not so high as to say. And with uh, the, the uh, Mennonites and the Amish, they were really persecuted heavily. And I wanted to read a little something here that I, I, I just saw recently. I thought, wow, well, it kind of puts things in perspective. It says a history in, in a book called The History of the Amish People and Their Faith by Norma Fisher McLaren. She recounts that early Amish and Mennonites were brought to trial tortured, branded, dropped from a ladder into fire, beheaded, garroted, drowned, dismembered, and burned at the stake. They were noted for their incredibly unwavering refusal to compromise their beliefs, even in the face of certain death. So when you think about coming from that background and the persecution they, they uh, experienced, and for many, many years, we're talking hundreds of years, not just a couple of years. It's a long period of time. And they uh, really, uh, they used to, in some cases, practice their faith off in the woods so that people would know that they were Amish and Mennonite. They did what they had to do to survive. And in those days, I'm not going to dwell on the past. I, I'm really going to focus on today. But I want to just to sign, kind of step, set the stage. Because there still is a fair amount of prejudice toward them. And it's, it runs deep with some people. And some people aren't very accepting of people that are different from them or have some different beliefs. But basically, they're fundamentalist Christians. That's basically what they're. Their religion is no different than just what we call Protestant, but fundamentalists. They, they go with the Bible, and they, they stick with things very close to the Bible, and they do not believe in a, a centralized, uh, unified church that dictates everything. They have broken it down into communities, and the communities decide what they believe and, and how they practice their faith. So with that in mind, uh, well, let me just talk briefly about the split between the Mennonite and the Amish, because they were kind of seen as one for a lot of years. And then um, the Mennonite really didn't think it was a good idea to do the shunning things. And for shunning, 
Um, and I thought shunning was once you're out, you're out. You know, you're out forever. Well, not, that's not really the case. Uh, they're, they're pretty accepting, and uh, they use shunning to kind of control the community, and especially to kind of to influence the young ones. And I, I've seen recently in, in our little world here some shunning go on with some of my neighbor kids. And kids are kids, you know, when they're teenagers, they're, they're trying to work around, they want to listen to some music, and they want to, they want to uh, talk to their friend on the cell phone, and, and little things like that going on. But when it gets discovered, it becomes a church thing. It's brought to the community, and the community then decides. And uh, some of my neighbor and the kids have been shunned, but for like maybe two weeks or a month. So they get a little feeling of what it's like to be in, but out, if you know what I mean. And so they, they then can kind of, I guess, reform that behavior and make some different choices that are better choices for the community. So they, the Amish still use shunning. The Mennonite do not. They don't believe that's uh, in the best interest of the, the church and the community. And that's where they split and back in, I think it was, 1735 or something, uh, Jacob uh, Amon uh, kind of said, you know what, Mennonites are going to not use shunning. We believe shunning really works for us. And, and the Amish kind of took that approach and went with him. He, he, was a, he had actually been like a, a priest uh, up till that point, and then he kind of became an Anabaptist and then moved into the Amish and Mennonite area. But at any rate, uh, they, uh, they also, at the same time, the Amish wanted to set themselves a little bit apart from the others to be able to be recognized as Amish, which they didn't want to before that. They, they really, there was too much persecution going on. And it was costing lives. So then in the seven, early 1700s, they said, well, let's, let's kind of mix it up a little bit here. And that's when they started with the, the, the grooming, the beards, the dress, uh, all the things that make them kind of appear to be who they are. And we'll get to that in just a minute here. But uh, actually, thinking about the Amish and Mennonites, the, the very first ones that came to Pennsylvania was sometime in the 1680s. So it's not that awful long ago, historically. I mean, for our country, that's kind of a waste. But, but it's, it's not that awful long ago. And uh, that first... Uh, community was established in Pennsylvania in that Lancaster area in 1737. So that's, and they've kind of come a long way since then. At any rate, let's see if I move this. Okay, good. Very briefly, I, I found this. Uh, this is a pretty good representation of some of the Amish beliefs. Not all of it, I, I don't believe, is true. But uh, so the Amish are, are a very conservative Christian faith group, <coughs> definitely true. And many of their beliefs are identical to those of fundamentalists and other evangelical churches, including baptism, the literal interpretation of the Bible, etc. And, um, and they, they spend a lot of time, obviously, in church and, and, and everything, uh, and, and all the things associated with it. But the community and the lifestyle is really what makes them Amish. Some differences. It says their beliefs in remaining separate from the rest of the world. And they do. They do try and maintain uh, some distance. And if you can imagine kids growing up, uh, and they see their neighbors riding bicycles, riding motorcycles, cell phones, all that other stuff. I, I don't know how they really keep the kids on the farm the way they do but it's all part of the, the community and the culture that is a part of that. Um, their rejection of involvement with the military or warfare, they are pacifists, they, they do not serve in the military, um, and they're, they're, they're not any couple to, or any group to, uh, to deal with anything physically. You know, they will, they will negotiate and work things out here. Each, each district is autonomous, and there is no centralized Amish organization. And when you say a district, that's like a, an area that would have a bishop. And the bishop would have a few elders in their community. 
And then there would be just the rest of the, the community kind of supporting that. Now, they don't have a church, per se, nothing like this kind of a building. They go to each other's homes, and they do that every other Sunday. So one Sunday is a church Sunday, the next Sunday is a visiting Sunday. So instead of going to the church, they'll go visit their friends and people who are part of that community, family, whatever, have gatherings, different things. And then uh, the next Sunday would be, the third Sunday would be a church Sunday again. And when they have the church Sunday, they take turns rotating to all the members of the church. So because of the size of their houses, which are usually pretty good size, they build, they may buy a farm, but they usually tear the house down and put up their own house the way they want. And they'll build a couple of big rooms in the house that can accommodate for large gatherings because that's where all their weddings will take place. That's where their, their family gatherings, that's where church will take place. So it's a real important thing to have that space in each home. So they, uh, I don't know. Uh, it says they traditionally avoided attempts to seek converts, and that is true. They do not try and convert, try and bring people into the church. Uh, they found that just, that doesn't work. If you want to be an Amish, you got to really want to be an Amish. It's, it's a life, and it's a tough one. Uh, it says here, it says, recently some Amish groups have become active in, in evangelism. And that's not true. I, do, I have never heard of any group. And from talking with my Amish friends, and from talking not just here, but here, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, um, Indiana, different communities, I've asked them, I said, is this true? And they said, no, we, we do not try and uh, bring people in. It just doesn't work. They've, gotta, they've really got to be a part of the group. Uh, and I would say, well, okay. Uh, it says the or or is uh, is the oral tra tradition which uh, regulates the Amish way of life. It's some of it is oral and some of it is written, but it's basically the rules how that community deals with everybody and everything in their community. And it's it's a really a it's taught in the schools and it kind of goes through the church and it's a part of the way of life and it's certainly reinforced in the families, all the rules. Uh, specific details of the order differ from various church districts and that's where, where groups sometimes will split. And if you think about it, if there's uh, 20 families, and typically 20 would be a, a, a typical number for a group. And so if you got 20 families and, you know, they tend to have of children. As the Amish say, when, when the oven's hot, you make bread. <laughs> and they, uh, and they, uh, they, tend to, they tend to have, you know, 10, 12, 15 kids. And, and, uh, and they, uh, so if you've got 20 families, you can see how the numbers are going to kind of explode fairly quickly. So then the community will split and they become two and maybe then they have to split later. So there's splits that go on in an ongoing kind of a, a fashion just because of natural growth in the community. And, and it's probably a good thing because it allows certain people in the community who, have, who think differently than maybe some of the others, they have a chance to, to go to a different community, become a different district with different rules. And, and so it works for them. They, they aren't gonna impose their different views on other people. So um, that kind of is a natural progression of the Amish uh, communities, and it just goes on over time. And some of, some of the things are, are very minor. I mean, in our area, uh, I get amazed at how specific and how, uh, what's okay and what's not okay. And, and the kids, you know, teenagers have a real problem with that as well. And that's where it's some issues with some of the kids. You can just imagine. I mean, things like, for example, in our area we had a, a thing recently where workers were not going to be allowed in the future to get in a car to go work on a job. They have to take their horse. And if it's in the, the distance was approximately 20 miles is a general rule of thumb they use. So within 20 miles you can work. 
Well, if they got a big job and it was 22 miles away, they weren't supposed to take that job. That'd be somebody else that's from a different district or something. So you can see that it, 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 some of the younger ones just they don't swallow that real well. <laughs> And it causes a little friction here and there, and, and, and but they work things out. Um, well, let me let me move back. So the church, the church. When you say the church, the, there is no church. It's it's the community. It's it's the gang. It's the it's all the people. The hierarchy that exists. They select their own bishop. So if a bishop it gets older, can't keep up with all the responsibilities, he'll step down. And the bishop um, is responsible for, as we said, um, they have church every other week. Well, the bishop has church every week because he serves one half of the community on, on the first and third uh, Sunday, the other half of the community on the second and fourth Sundays. So the bishop is busy, and, and he's also got the elders helping him out throughout all that. So there's a lot going on with those guys. And uh, they also have their own jobs, they have their own uh, things going on in the community, their own family obligations and everything. But uh, they're, 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 they're really pretty busy. And the community is really very supportive of, of their particular rules, their, their community, and everything that's going on within that community. There are none, as I mentioned, the Book of Rules, again, it, 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 it can change. They can decide to make changes in, in that, but it's a community decision. It's not just the bishop, it's not just somebody in the community. It's something that's usually discussed and decided and thought about quite a bit before some changes happen. And the baptism thing that I mentioned before is what makes them somewhat different with the Anabaptist approach with adults. Now a person, sometimes people will say, well gee, the Amish have a beard as soon as they get married. That's not necessarily true. Usually they get have a beard when they get married, but they can start growing a beard when they join the church. That's the important thing. When they make that decision and become baptized, that's when they'll start growing a beard for the men. Um, but then usually, they get married shortly after they join the church. And before long, there's six kids. <laughs> it's just kind of the way Amish life is here. Uh, let's move on. So when you think of Amish, there's a lot of different orders. And it's so hard to distinguish, uh, distinct, really distinguish between one and the other. This is what we call the old, old order, or the Schwarzenegger Amish. The, uh, the people who are, who are, uh, I guess they call them the plain folk. You know, that's the term that would be used for, for uh, the old order Amish. And they tend to really try and be, look like everybody else. Nobody stands out, everybody's got the same clothes, all their clothes are made by the wives, um, the kids, the adults, the teenagers, everybody's. And the women will always wear those hats, uh, those bonnets. And that's actually three layers in there. They have uh, like a scarf over their head. They have a, a white hat then over that. And then they'll have the, the bonnet over the top. There's always at least three layers. I'm not sure why. I just know that's the way it is. And then the men uh, usually will have the coat and a vest and, and then the pants. If they're really fancy, they get pockets, you know. But you don't, you don't always see that in, in everybody. It depends on how good a sewer that wife is, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're... Now, speaking of orders, uh, there's, I'm aware of at least five different orders of Amish. And these would be considered the lowest order of Amish, meaning the most, the most uh, basic, the most... Uh, uh, the most strict with the Bible, they tend to be very, very conservative Amish. Uh, their kids won't ride a bicycle. They won't be allowed to ride a bicycle. They, uh, they don't necessarily play too much. Uh, the kids won't be having little play horses or, or anything like you might think. 
because they've got farm animals and all that, you think, well, that would, that would make sense, but not necessarily. Uh, they're, they're just very conservative, and if you're dealing with those kind of Amish, always ask the parents if it's okay, if you wanted to give the kids something. And, and if they say, fine, sure, go for it. But uh, they're, always check with the parents for anything that you might do if you wanted to help them or whatever. Uh, the next order, the orders kind of go up through and they tend to be uh, differentiated by different things that are okay with their rules. That's what sets them apart. For instance, I was in Ohio, I went to one of my friend's house and uh, I went to see him about some pheasants. <laughs> and we walk in the barn, he says, oh, come on in the barn. I walk in the barn, he reaches over, flips the switch, lights all came on. I go, how would you do that? And he says, well, didn't you look when you walked in? I go, look at what? He says, up on the roof. He said, we have solar panels. <laughs> they have them on the house in the barn. Now, he was a higher order Amish. He also carried a cell phone. He had, he had a Facebook page where he sold things for his work. He wasn't allowed to use it for anything else, but he used it for his work. And, and I believe he was pretty strict about it. He just, just didn't work with it. But, yeah, I don't understand all the rules. I know there's a lot of different rules, and certain things are okay, and certain things are not okay. And it just it depends on the community. It depends on the order. I was at a, a bishop's house out in, out in Ohio. I've mentioned Ohio a lot because that's probably the largest of all the communities in the United States. It is remarkably big. Holmes County, Ohio is about 85 to 90% Amish, the whole county. And it's beautiful, it's nice. They've really seen what they had going on out in Lancaster and said, we can do that and do it even better. <laughs> And they've really developed an awful lot over the last 25, 30 years that I've been going out there. I've seen a big change. You know, the roads don't just, they're not just two lanes. There used to be two lanes and, and then a ditch. There was like no shoulder, no nothing. Now when you go down, there's a two lane, like 10 foot lane for each side, plus like a, an eight foot uh, shoulder for the buggies, the buggy lane. And so it's just so much safer for the horses and buggies and people. There's been too many deaths. You know, somebody comes over a hill, you know, and the sun is in their eyes, they, they don't even see it, you know, or, or the buggy's not well marked. Somebody's going to die. And we're going through some of that around this area right now. We've had some terrible, terrible accidents. I got a call one morning, uh, about six in the morning. Could you come up north of Hinkley? Uh, some guy who's driving down the road in 365, Buggy was coming, Adam, he, uh, he fell asleep at the wheel. Piled right into him. The horses were injured, the buggy was smashed, the people went flying. Um, everybody survived, but you know, it, it, it's, and as they say, well, it's God's will. And they just kind of move on. Uh, their ways are different than ours, and that's, that's just part of what the Amish thing is. But the different orders are all certainly there and, and lots of different rules. That, that bishop's house that I mentioned, I, I went to his house, uh, they just have horses. All the Amish that I know have horses. I went to his house and he's the bishop in his big district and he had a tractor, a giant deer tractor with rubber tires. I'm like, oh. You know, I've never seen that. <laughs> and he's, he's an upper level Amish. Almost, almost a Mennonite, <laughs> I would say. But just uh, very unique to see the differences in what's okay and what's not okay. And, and every group is, is like that. Oops, go this way. So the dress matters. The, uh, the Amish can see another Amish person and by the, by the width of the brim, the, the brim of their hat or the, the ribbon that goes around their head, they know which order they're in. I'm not that sophisticated to tell you. I, I got a pretty good idea, but I don't always know. And uh, the clothes, the women in these pictures are mostly Mennonite. And you'll see the colors down below. You wouldn't see that in, in Amish. They, they don't do that. Uh, in the upper corner as well, definitely Mennonite. These are Mennonite girls. 
the Amish girls would be in the in the upper uh, left, and they uh, they'll almost always have that bonnet on when they're off the farm, or off the, away from home, and uh, the hats makes me think of it. I, I went to to a barn raising, and uh, we went in at lunchtime. Went in, and everybody took their hat off and flipped it in this buggy, and so I, I was there, and I. I Tried to fit in a little bit, you know. So I had a blue shirt on and blue jeans. I had I wore my cowboy hat, and I took it off and put it in the buggy. And I, one of the one of the kids was standing there. I go, gee, I sure hope I can find my hat when I come back out here. <laughs> she started giggling, you know. <laughs> but at any rate, they uh, the look is is very much Amish. I mean, at a glance, you you just know that's what what they are. Oops. So the education. Uh, kids all go to school to the eighth grade. They start at about five. They go to the eighth grade. Fourteen years old, they're done. And uh, their skills that they're really hammering on them are math and English, because they don't know English when they first get there. Uh, the only thing spoken to the young ones and at home is the Pennsylvania Dutch, Deutsch. You know, that's where they basically come from. Switzerland and in the uh, upper areas of uh, Germany and up to the Netherlands. But the, their their native tongue is really the Pennsylvania Dutch. And uh, in the schools, the teacher is one of the older daughters, unmarried, of, of a respected member of the community. And her education is she went through the eighth grade. <laughs> and that's it. When it says they must meet New York State requirements, that's like the number of contact hours in the classroom, the number of days, all that is the same. They start a little earlier, they end a little earlier. Their parents need them out planting the fields a little earlier in the springtime. Our kids get out in <coughs> June, they're, they're done by beginning of May. They, they have to be out there doing some work. And the boys, their focus, uh, whether it be in school or immediately after school at 14, they're learning a trade, some kind of a skill, something that the community needs is what they will pick up. And everybody will learn something different. So they can, uh, if they have to order something from far away, well, the third son will learn that skill so that the community won't have to send it away. They can have it made right here. Uh, we just got a guy in this area.